Now I want to look at the New Testament. Turn to that, that second portion of our Bible, those 27 books that focus on the Jesus event, how Jesus changed everything. And before we get there, I want to talk for a moment about something that happened in the, amongst the Jewish people between the two Testaments. So you have about uh, 400 plus years between the end of the, the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And in that 400 year period, um, a, something developed, uh, you could call it a theological development happened amongst the, a lot of the Jewish people. Um, we'll give this the title that scholars give it and we'll kind of unpack it then. It's called Jewish Apocalyptic Eschatology. So I want to talk about the rise of Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. A big f bundle of words that basically just means this. Apocalyptic means uh, something's been revealed. Literally is the Greek word for, to, uh, for, for revelation or something's been revealed to people. Eschatology just means study of the end times. Uh, what will happen when God turns up in the world and, and makes everything right. So to say Jewish apocalyptic eschatology is simply to say what the Jews came to believe is true about what God's going to do to make all the evil in this world finally right again. How is God going to overcome evil? That's basically the, the, what, what, what we we're talking about when we talk about Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. Now during this 400 year period between the Old and New Testaments, the Jews began to uh, discern, study their Old Testaments, what we call Old Testament. That was, of course, their only testament at the time. <clears throat> and uh, I believe, on top of that, God was beginning to reveal thing, new things to the Jews in preparation for Jesus Messiah. And during this time period, between the Testaments, the Jews became more and more uh, conversant with or using the words of Satan, uh, demons, and evil spirits. We said how that, that wasn't used too much in the Old Testament, but during this period of time between the Testaments, a lot of Jews began to think about and speculate about and uh, write r books about Satan and demons and evil spirits. <clears throat> angels as well, so both angels and demons. They also began to imagine that what God was doing is that he was about to bring a brand new age. They called it literally the, the age to come, which would be a, a new time period, a whole new way of, of history being uh, that would do away with this present evil age. That's what they called it, this present evil age in which Satan had come to be a dominant power, but that God was going to come and put Satan's kingdom down, put it, it would be gone forever finally, and God's kingdom would replace it. And of course, the decisive moment where that would shift from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God was when Messiah, when Messiah came in, because it would be Messiah that God would use to stop evil and to start the reign of God, the kingdom of God. So those categories were already being talked about by many Jewish people before Jesus ever was born. They were waiting for Messiah to come and put down the evil rebellion and to initiate a brand new uh, season, a season that would last forever now, an eternal season of the kingdom of God flourishing in this world. And it's really into that world that Jesus was born now with that expectation by many Jews of awaiting for the powerful Messiah who will defeat evil and usher in the kingdom of God. Now, as Jesus steps into this world and begins to eventually start preaching and teaching, he starts using this language. One of the most familiar phrases on Jesus' lips in our Gospels, at least the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is kingdom of God. He, Jesus just can't stop talking about the kingdom of God. In fact, he even starts to identify himself with the kingdom of God. Where Jesus goes into a town in Galilee, he'll say things like, Behold, the kingdom is here. 
He's in, it's in your midst. Um, almost as if Jesus thinks that he's the kingdom. And of course, that's precisely right. Because the kingdom is simply where God's will is done. And wherever Jesus went, he did God's will. So Jesus is that mustard seed, that first moment of the fullness of God's kingdom penetrating into our world, taking up residence in a plot of ground over in first century Palestine, the Holy Land, and Jesus begins it right there with himself and then begins to grow that seed. And it's still growing today. But here's the thing. When you talk about the kingdom of God, as Jesus did, you cannot help but then talk about and know about the kingdom of darkness. Because it's the two kingdoms that are in conflict in this time and in this place. So Apostle Paul, for example, says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 13, he says, He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he's transferred us to the kingdom of God's dear son. So there you go. There's the two kingdoms. Uh, Jesus teaches and talks this way. Uh, Jesus talks about Satan as the prince of this world. He talks about Satan as the strong man. Uh, Paul will pick up on this language and talk about Satan as um, the god of this world or the prince of the power of the air. Uh, John, in, in 1 John 5, 19, says, All the world lies under the power of the evil one. So the New Testament is very clear. The kingdom of God is here in Jesus, but the kingdom of the enemy, it's been here for some time since the fall. And it's that kingdom that Jesus has to address as the Messiah. Now, one of the things that the Jews didn't anticipate, kind of where Jesus' model of the two kingdoms differed from the common Jewish model was in this point. It seems that the Jews thought that when Messiah got here, there would be a very quick transition, that the kingdom of darkness would very quickly be gone and the full kingdom of God would very quickly get started and, and would take over and there would, be, there would be no more evil. Jesus turns up and he actually teaches something different. He teaches a two-stage coming of Messiah. That when Messiah comes the first time, Messiah comes to die for his people, to rise, to ascend back to heaven. But then there'll be a second coming when Messiah comes to finally complete the destruction of the kingdom of darkness. And in between those two comings, the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, we live in a period of time where both the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God are in play. They're both happening on this planet, and thus the spiritual war is intense during this time. From the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, until whenever it is he returns, we are living in an intense spiritual warfare context. One might ask the question, how in the world did this happen? How could it be the case that God, who created everything perfect and is going to eventually make everything perfect, how did God, like how did things get out of control? How could God lose control of creation such that a kingdom of darkness takes over? How could it be that if God is the sovereign God, why, do it, why does the New Testament say that all the world lies under the power of the evil one? These are challenging questions. I think what we have to do to understand this is we have to go back to the fall, to the fall in Genesis 3. One of the things that we see in Genesis 1 is this. God puts humans in charge of subduing and stewarding his earth. In chapter 3, we see that that relationship of, of stewardship or uh, uh, ruling over the earth has been broken. In fact, God says, no longer will the earth um, respond to you, Adam. Rather, by sweat uh, of your brow will you toil over the earth. From dust you were taken, to dust you shall return. It seems that the, the authority that God gave humanity over the planet initially was lost 
when we chose to follow the rebellious path of Satan. Now, interestingly, years later, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, one of the temptations, this, we find this in Luke chapter 4, uh, Satan says to Jesus, hey, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now, why he's saying that, of course, is because Messiah, who Jesus is Messiah, was supposed to come and take all the kingdoms of the world back from Satan. So here's Satan saying, hey, tell you what, you don't even have to fight for them. I'll give them to you. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. You can be Messiah. Just one thing. Just bow down and worship me. Now, in the midst of this deal that Satan's making to Jesus, he says this. The reason I can give you all the kingdoms is because they've been handed to me, and now I give them to anyone I want to. I mean, Satan is claiming that someone handed him the kingdoms of the world, and he now gets to decide who's in charge. And the interesting thing is Jesus never says, oh, you're lying. You don't own the kingdoms. Uh, the kingdoms are my father's. No, Jesus tacitly agrees. You're right, Satan. They were handed to you, and you do decide who's in charge. But here's the thing, Jesus says, I'm not going to bow down to you to get them. I'm going to go the long, hard, slow, painful way of the cross to get them, not the quick, easy way of bowing down. Why? Because, and Jesus just refers, as he always does, back to the, to, the, to the scriptures, for there is one God only, and him only shall you serve. So Jesus has his theology correct and chooses the hard path rather than the easy path. But what he does not disagree with Satan, no argument from Jesus, he does not disagree that Satan owns the, the kingdoms of this world. How did that happen? Quite simply, it seems, God created this world, gave it to humans, us, to steward, and when we chose rebellion, when we chose the fall, we literally, we're the ones that handed the creation over to Satan. That was not God. God handed it to us in the garden, said to Adam and Eve, steward it, protect it, guard it, and we did not guard it. We handed it right to the enemy, and from that day forward, Satan, apparently, According to Jesus, according to Paul, according to John, Satan's now been the one in charge, and Jesus came back to take those kingdoms back from Satan through the process of agape love, self-sacrificial death, rising from the dead, the long, hard way of the cross. We can also look at spiritual warfare themes in Jesus' ministry. I mean, in a really important way, all of Jesus' ministry was spiritual warfare. Here's a way that the book of Acts summarizes Jesus' ministry. It's Acts 10.38. It says this, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So really, in the book of Acts here, Jesus' entire ministry is summed up by, and he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by Satan. Um, what Jesus is doing is he's coming against the kingdom of darkness everywhere he goes. Now, one of the ways we can see this is by remembering that in the ancient Jewish mindset, you could tell whether you're in the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God by looking around you and asking the question, well, what's going on here? You know, uh, what's happening around me? So, for example, if you look around you and you see sin, uh, darkness and deception, demons in people's lives, disease, death, if you see those, kind of, those five things happening, sin, darkness, demons, disease, and death, you know you're in the midst of the kingdom of darkness because those are the powers that the enemy Satan uses to hold people in bondage and in destruction. But if you look around you ever and find yourself with not sin, but right relationship, love relationship, if you look around and don't see uh, uh, darkness and deception, but you see truth and light, well, you know that God's at work here. If you look around and see not demons, not evil spirits, but the Holy Spirit, you know 
you're in the presence of God. If you see not disease and death, but rather healing and resurrection, you know the God of life is in your, is in your midst. And so these were, this was how the Jews could tell. Uh, so what does Jesus do? Well, as Messiah, he comes to the earth and begins to minister. And when he sees any of the powers of darkness, sin, lies and deception, demons, disease, and death, he just starts attacking those things, right? Jesus sees sin, he forgives it. Jesus sees deception and darkness, he teaches truth and life. Jesus sees demons, he casts them out. Jesus sees disease, he heals it. When Jesus comes upon death, he raises people from the dead. So it turns out that all these miracles Jesus are, is doing in his ministry aren't just like some, uh, yeah, what, 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 what cool trick should I do today? It's every single one of them are matched to some power of darkness that Satan is holding people in bondage to. Jesus is this strategist where every day he gets up, he gets alone with his father, as we're told, he, a lot of prayer time alone in the morning, kind of get in touch with, with the father, then goes out and spends his day just bringing the kingdom of God against the powers of darkness. That's Jesus' entire ministry. Interestingly, Jesus says to us, to his, to his disciples on the last night, and through them to us, I go now to the Father, and I'll send you the Spirit, and greater works will you do than I did, Jesus says to us, his church. The good news is, when you're a kingdom person, you step into the ways of Jesus, and you now are the body of Christ, the part of that body that is bringing uh, forgiveness to sin, that's bringing light and truth against darkness, that's bringing healing and bringing deliverance against demons and sickness, and that's bringing life into a dead world. We are called to do the kind of works Jesus did. Finally, and just very quickly, we can say that spiritual warfare is even a central part of how Jesus' death brings salvation to us. According to 1 John 3, 8, it says this, The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And we know that one of the major works of Satan was to hold people in bondage because of their sin. When we break covenant with God, sin, it gave Satan this powerful right into our lives. And when Jesus comes and dies in our place, taking on our covenant death for us, it releases us from that power that Satan had over us. Uh, Colossians 2 talks about this beautifully, that the things that Satan had against us he could use, Jesus took and nailed them to his cross. Our sins nailed to his cross. What's called the Christus Victor model of the atonement. Uh, atonement, just a word meaning what Jesus did to save us. Uh, the Christus Victor model focuses on the fact that so much of what Jesus did to save us was spiritual warfare. It was coming against the works of the enemy in our life, the bondage he had over us, the power he had over us, and liberating us from all of that. So that is a, uh, a quick run-through of some of the major themes of spiritual warfare in the Old and New Testaments. God bless you.